So welcome to the Contribute webinar. My name is Felix Bierbrauer. I'm a professor of economics at the University of Cologne. And I will be presenting a research on politically feasible reforms of nonlinear tax systems. And this is joint work with my dear colleagues, Pierre Boyer and Andreas Peichel. Um, I will be supported by another colleague, Emmanuel Hansen, who um, will uh, later be important when we come to questions and answers, and he will take care of them. And I will say a couple of words about that um, in a second. Uh, let me begin with uh, a couple of words about the institution that is running the webinar. A contribute is a cluster of excellence, which is funded uh, by Germany's Excellence Initiative. It's run jointly by the universities of Bonn and Cologne. And what is really at the heart of this um, uh, research initiative is to bring fundamental research in economics and neighboring disciplines to the analysis and also to the design of public policy measures. The Cluster of Excellence has uh, different research areas and the talk today will uh, be related to activities in three of those. So the first one is the research area on theoretical foundations. So the paper will have theorems characterizing politically feasible tax reforms. The other research area that this is related to is the area on distribution. We will talk a lot about uh, the design of nonlinear tax and transfer systems so we're covering progressive taxation and redistribution. And uh, finally, we talk about political constraints in the design of tax systems. And this brings uh, a connection to the research area on political economy. Um, so the, the format is going to look uh, as follows. I will be presenting this work now for roughly 30 minutes. And then there will be um, the possibility to um, discuss, to give comments, uh, to raise questions, and so forth. Um, unfortunately, we will not be able to discuss as we go along. I understand that we all enjoy you know, lively and active seminars, but experience uh, has shown that with these online um, presentations, this is uh, um, difficult to have this as we go along. So um, we'll have to wait 30 minutes and then I hope to hear your comments and uh, your questions and then we can uh, get in interaction. Um, you can at the end, after those 30 minutes, um, either raise your hand so as to indicate uh, to Emmanuel that you want to say something, but there's also a chat function that gives you the opportunity to raise questions or give comments as we go along, but then the reaction to these comments and questions uh, will be a bit later. Um, a final remark is that um, this is um, recorded and will be uploaded on YouTube later on. And so uh, I want to make you aware of that fact. All right, um, let me then get right into uh, the material. Um, so what is the motivation of this, um, this whole research? Uh, program. So we want to get a new approach for the political economy analysis of nonlinear taxation. And um, the reason for doing this is that while there have been many papers on the political economy of taxation, these approaches in the literature have difficulties dealing with nonlinear taxation. Um, the difficulty comes from the fact that um, nonlinear taxes are a multidimensional policy space. And then when you play the usual game of um, you know, setting up 
problem of, of party competition where you have two parties proposing tax policies and, um, and uh, then they try to win an election and you try to come up with a game theoretic analysis of that situation and possibly a characterization of equilibrium tax policy, you run into difficulties with nonlinear um, taxation. And uh, as a consequence of that, we lack really a political economy workhorse for nonlinear taxation. At the same time, it would be important to have such um, a tractable approach because in real world, tax and transfer systems are nonlinear. In many countries, we have earning subsidies for the poor. We typically have progressive income taxation so that um, marginal tax rates depend on income. Um, in many countries, it's highly debated what the tax rate on the top earners should be. And um, unless we have a political economy perspective on linear taxation, we will uh, lack a systematic understanding uh, of what is going on there. A final piece of motivation is that we have a very elaborate theory of optimal welfare maximizing taxation. And there is the question to what extent these beautiful tax systems, which are characterized in that theory, actually have a chance in the political process. So the extent to which those policies can be decentralized. And unless we have a political economy analysis of nonlinear taxes, we will not be able to answer that very basic question. Okay, so this is the motivation. And what is then the approach that we are going to take? So we will depart from the standard analysis of voting over tax schedules and go for a much simpler exercise. And the exercise is to hypothesize that there is some status quo in tax policy that we have somehow inherited from the past. And then ask whether there is a possibility to reform this status quo in a politically feasible way. And by political feasible way, I mean such that there is a majority of the people in favor of the reform. And so this is what we're doing here. We attempt a characterization of politically feasible tax reforms and our analysis will get traction from focusing on reforms with a particular property on monotonic tax reforms. So let me right away define what that is. Suppose you have an initial situation with an initial tax schedule, call that T0, and then you do a tax reform. So you replace this initial tax schedule by a new tax schedule that we call T1. And then we say, a tax reform is monotonic if the difference between the tax payments that you owe before and after the reform is a monotonic function of income. That's what we call a monotonic tax reform. So let me give uh, you examples. So as a first example, think of raising taxes on the rich. So for instance, you do a reform so that everybody who is making more than 100,000 a year um, has to pay um, on this income, a marginal tax rate that's increased by 1%. That's a monotonic tax reform. People with income below 100,000, for them, the change in the tax burden is zero. And then for people above, it's increasing in income. Another example uh, of a monotonic tax reform is, for instance, these are things that we know from the German debate, um, getting rid of bracket creep or of kalte Progression as it's called in German, or getting rid of the Soli, the Solidaritätszuschlag in the German income tax system. These are examples of tax reforms where everybody's tax burden is reduced by a certain percentage, say X percent. Now, if you have a progressive tax system and so your tax burden is an increasing function of income, and if you then lower everybody's tax burden by the same percentage amount, that's going to imply that richer people have a bigger tax cut. And so we are having a monotonic tax reform. Yeah? So we will <clears throat> focus on monotonic tax reforms um, in this analysis. So more specifically, what are we going to do and what am I going to present? So first there is a theory part. 
where we develop a theory of politically feasible tax reforms. It consists of a, a median voter theorem saying that for monotonic reforms, political feasibility is really the same as um, a reform being in the interest of people with close to median income. And then we will have a second theorem characterizing politically feasible reform directions. And so the basic message of that theorem is there will be political pressure to lower tax rates below the median, to increase tax rates above the median, unless we have an inefficient tax system to begin with. So this is the theory part. And on the basis of that theory part, we will then provide an empirical analysis of tax reforms. And the bulk of that analysis is dealing with reforms of the federal income tax in the US and reforms that took place after uh, the Second World War. Um, we'll do this on the basis of tax return microdata and we will make use of um, the micro simulation model that's known as NBER TaxSim. Yeah, and then we will sort of look at these tax reforms in a way that is guided by our theory. So we will study to what extent the relationship that's postulated by the median voter theorem, we can actually find that relation in the data. So remember the relation is support by people with close to median income goes together with majority support in the population at large. And we will check whether this relation holds for tax reforms uh, that took place in the US. And then we will also see whether the directions that the reforms took are in line with um, what comes out of theorem two, i.e. The, the proposition that there is a political pressure to lower tax rates below the median, to increase tax rates above, um, and as a consequence to have a region with pronounced progressivity uh, in between. Um, I have a, a couple of quick comments on, on related literature. Um, so I mentioned already the important literature on voting over tax schedules. Uh, I mentioned a couple of references on this slide. These are sort of the classical, the seminal references, at least some of those. And as I said, we are departing from that approach because we are not really looking at voting over tax schedules, but what we share with this literature is the broad motivation of having a political economy perspective on redistributive taxation. Um, the second strand of related literature deals with perturbation approaches in optimal taxation. And um, this is a way of characterizing optimal tax systems really. So a perturbation approach makes a particular thought experiment, namely to ask, what are the welfare implications if I modify marginal tax rates in a certain bracket of incomes, say for incomes between 80,000 and 90,000 a year. And then an optimal tax system is characterized by the condition that no such tax perturbation has a positive uh, effect on welfare. Now it turns out that these simple tax perturbations, you know, modify marginal tax rates for incomes in a particular bracket, these are monotonic tax reforms. That is, our first theorem applies to them. So here we have a very nice set of tax reforms that lend themselves both to a welfare analysis and to a political economy analysis. And this relates our work um, to literature and optimal taxation that is based on the perturbation method. Um, you will see that for our characterization of politically feasible tax systems, Pareto bounds play an important role. That is, we will have to characterize situations in which um, tax systems can be reformed in such a way that everybody is better off and distinguish those from situations in which reforms necessarily have winners and losers. And so we need this um, characterization as an input in our analysis and this links what we do with work on Pareto efficient nonlinear taxation and a couple of references uh, are on this slide. Finally, 
we draw on micro simulation models in our uh, empirical analysis. And um, in terms of research methods, we're really following work that has been done by uh, ISA and co-authors or Bargain and co-authors in previous work. What distinguishes us is that we sort of raise different questions. We look at tax reforms through the lens of the theoretical framework that we develop. And, and secondly, we cover a much larger set of tax reforms than other studies have done by looking sort of at all major tax reforms in the US uh, after the Second World War. Okay, so let me um, give you an outline of what's going to come. So I just completed the introduction. Um, the next part will then cover very quickly the model uh, on which our uh, analysis is based. Then I'll present the median voter theorem, theorem one. Then we come to theorem two, the characterization um, of politically feasible reforms and the implications for politically feasible reform directions. Um, this is the section on detecting politically feasible reforms. And finally, we'll get to the empirical analysis where we um, bring the theoretical insights um, to data. And then of course, in the end, I will conclude. Okay, so here is the basic model. It's, um, I, I, I state the, the basic setup here, we have various extensions of that setting that we discuss in the online appendix, but uh, for this presentation, we really focus uh, on the basics. So we look at the setting of a standard Milesian model of income taxation, we have a continuum of individuals. These individuals um, have a utility function and um, one argument in that utility function is their private goods consumption denoted by C. In the jargon of public finance, this is also after tax income. And then they have um, earnings or income Y in the utility function. And it's assumed that the generation of earnings comes with effort costs. For simplicity, we assume here um, uh, isoelastic effort costs. And then individuals differ by a measure of productivity that is affecting how painful it is to generate income. So we have low types, low omega values mean that it's very hard for you to generate income and high omega types have an easy time generating income. So in this setup, people with low omega always end up being poor and people with high omega always end up being rich. So individuals maximize this utility function and they do so facing a budget constraint. And the budget constraint is shaped by the tax system. Yeah, and what, what we see in the middle of this slide is what such a budget constraint looks like so first there is an intercept. This is the consumption level that you get if you have no income. Then your consumption increases with your income, but you also have to subtract the taxes that you owe and which depend on your income. Now we assume that tax reform affects this budget set that individuals are facing and we represent a tax reform always as a pair consisting of a scalar tau and the function h. Yeah, the scalar tau is a measure of the reform intensity. If you have a small reform, if you stay in the vicinity of the status quo, you have tau close to zero. And h is how we modify the tax function. Yeah, you see this um, in this expression here. So there is an initial tax function T naught, and then we modify this uh, with a reform. And so the new tax function then is the initial one plus the scalar tau times the function H evaluated at your income of Y. Yeah, so a tax reform modifies the tax function that uh, people are facing. And uh, the tax function generates tax revenue that we denote by R of tau and H. So, so this is the reform induced change in tax revenue. And here in the analysis, we consider budget balanced reforms. That is, we assume that the changes in tax revenue are absorbed by the basic income that everybody gets who is not um, earning anything. No? Again, you know, 
we have extensions in the paper where we look at different uses of tax revenue, but for simplicity, this um, um, is now based on the assumption that the intercept of the consumption schedule absorbs the changes in tax revenue. Um, a simple example of a tax reform is one in which, um, so I gave that example before, and the, the analysis of Emmanuel Saez oftentimes uh, uses this thought experiment. That's why we not only call it simple, but also sometimes Saezian reforms. So what is the thought experiment? Um, you modify the tax schedule as follows. You have a bracket that you define by an entry point YA and an end point YB, and you're modifying tax taxes in such a way that everybody who has an income below the entry point is not facing higher taxes. For people with an income in the bracket, the tax payment increases linearly with their income and everybody with an income above the bracket has um, a tax increase by a constant amount which no longer depends on their own income. Yeah, so this is what the age function looks like that corresponds to um, a simple reform where you just go to a particular bracket and slightly change the marginal tax rate applying to um, incomes in that bracket. Okay, so now I need to introduce um, a bit of terminology. So we have an indirect utility function here. This is um, V of tau H and omega. So this gives the reform induced change in indirect utility as a function of a person's type omega and as a function of the reform as captured by the scalar tau and the function h. We say that a reform is Pareto improving if this um, indirect utility function is positive um, for everybody and strictly positive for some people. We say that the reform is welfare improving if um, um, a weighted average of uh, these utility changes is positive. Here we have the welfare weights. And we say that the reform is politically feasible if the mass of people who are made better off uh, exceeds one half. Now this is our notion of political feasibility. There has to be a majority in favor of a reform. Okay, so we are now prepared um, to come to the first set of results. Um, in particular, to our first theorem, the median voter theorem. So the median voter theorem that I'm presenting here is one that is covering small reforms that stay in the vicinity of the status quo. Yeah? So we're asking, suppose we're having a small reform what are the conditions under which such a reform is politically feasible in the sense in which I just defined it, i.e. making a majority of the people better off. And then the theorem says, if this H function, this tax reform function is a monotonic function, then we have an equivalence of the median voter being made better off and the reform being politically feasible. Yeah. So this is sort of the, the, the basic finding we have, it extends to large reforms that we deal with that um, in the manuscript. Uh, we have modified versions of this finding that apply to reforms that are monotonic only above or below the median. By weakened versions, we have weakened versions in the sense that we no longer have if and only if statements, an equivalence between support by the median voter and majority support, but we only have that support by the median voter then is a sufficient condition for majority support. We also have extensions to multidimensional settings which differ from the current one, which people only differ in one characteristic, which is sort of this productivity measure omega. Yeah. So all that is in the paper. Here I focus now on, on the, the simplest case, which is uh, also the most, uh, which gives you the basic argument, namely a small reform that stays in the vicinity of the status quo. Okay, and, and for that we have an equivalence between support by the median voter and support in the population at large. So what is 
really going on here. The logic is is quite simple, and I um, I give you the main the main insight here. So if we look at a small reform that stays in the vicinity of the status quo, then we can look at the derivative of the indirect utility function in the reform intensity. And then we see two forces. On the one hand, there is the change in tax revenue, which is affecting everybody in the same way. That's the same for every person in the system. And then we have a second component, which is capturing the change in the person's tax burden. This is what the function H gives, evaluated at the status quo level of income. Ah, so we have a we have two effects, the change in tax revenue and the change in a person's tax burden. Yeah, so you like a reform, you're made better off by a reform. If there is a revenue gain, so if this derivative is positive and the revenue gain outweighs a potential tax increase that you're confronted with, uh, then you are a reform winner. Now, Let's try to see why it is true that support by the median voter implies majority support. So suppose that the median voter is indeed made better off. So the median voter has benefits from the, ref from the effect on tax revenue more than from uh, a potential increase of his tax burden. Then we know that age is a monotonic function because we're focusing on monotonic tax reforms. And we know that income in the status quo is a monotonic function because people can be ordered according to um, the spence merley single crossing condition, which implies that you know, high omega types make a lot of income, low omega types make few income. So H is a monotonic function of Y, Y is a monotonic function of omega. And so as a consequence, everybody who has below median income has an H expression, which is lower than the one for the median. Hence, the median voter has a majority on his side. And if he likes the reform, everybody with below median income will like it too. Yeah, and so similar arguments apply for all types of reforms that you might consider, reforms that come with a loss of revenue and possibly decrease the median voter's tax burden. As long as H is a monotonic tax reform, we have an equivalence between support by the median voter and support in the population at large. Now, as we will discuss in a couple of minutes, we want to bring that to the data and ask the question whether we can also find empirically that support by the median voter goes together with support in the population at large. And for that purpose, we need to transcend the analysis from small reforms to reforms that are not necessarily small. And that's true for the reforms that we observe in our data set. Yeah, and so this raises the question, if you have a sizable reform, how do you actually check whether the median voter is a reform winner or a reform loser? And we have a sufficient condition, which you see on this slide, which is, which is telling you that the median voter is a reform winner if this inequality is, um, is fulfilled. And let me explain uh, the logic of that condition to you. So the median voter is comparing two things, the change in revenue to the change in his tax burden. And there are now two ways of looking at the change in his tax burden. So what we have here is the change in his tax burden according to his post-reform income, Y1. And this is the change in the tax burden according to her pre-reform income, Y0. Yeah, and so if the revenue gain from the reform looms larger than um, the change in the tax burden, both according to post and according to pre-reform income, then the median voter is necessarily a winner. And we will take that approach when we um, bring the theory to the data in, in, uh, in a minute. Note that there is um, a similarity to standard concepts in consumer choice. So this is um, akin to looking at um, compensating and equivalent variations if we do welfare analysis associated with price changes. And you might remember that those differ according to whether we do the evaluation according to pre or post reform 
or post change prices. Now we do something very similar, except that it's not just for a linear price system, but for a nonlinear tax system. But the similarity is that we do an evaluation both in terms of pre-reform and in terms of post-reform income. Okay, so the second theorem that we have in the paper is concerned with directions for reform. And for that theorem, we are focusing on a smaller class of reforms, namely those which consist of the basic thought experiment of you know, varying marginal tax rates in the given bracket of income on simple tax reforms. And then we have a, th a theorem that says, suppose we have an interior Pareto optimum. That is, we have initially a status quo tax system, which cannot be reformed in such a way that everybody is made better off. Yeah, whenever you reform, you're bound to have winners and losers. Then what the theorem says is, for below median incomes, you can lower marginal tax rates in a politically feasible way. And for above median incomes, you can raise marginal tax rates in a politically feasible way. So what the theorem says, there is sort of a discontinuity at the median level of income. You know, above the median level, you can raise taxes. Below the median income, you can lower taxes. Um, the theorem also implies that if you know you go into that direction, you are bound to have a region with pronounced progression connecting the area with the low marginal tax rates for the poor and the area with the high marginal tax rates for the rich. Yeah. Um, so this is the theorem. What is sort of the logic here? Why is it true that you can, for instance, lower marginal tax rates below the median in a politically feasible way? Well, the logic is as follows. If you lower marginal tax rates for below median incomes, that is going to imply that everybody who has an above median income benefits from a tax cut. Yeah. So you lower tax rates below the median, but support for that comes from people with above median income, comes from the richer part of the population. The mirror image is raising marginal tax rates on above median incomes. This change of the tax schedule is not going to affect the poorer part of the population, but these people will benefit from the increase of tax revenue. Yeah. So you can lower tax rates on the poor and get the majority support for that from the rich, or you can raise the taxes on the rich and get the majority support for that from the poor. That's the logic um, of the theorem and what we then do in the paper is we want to develop a sufficient statistics approach that tells you what types of reforms are politically feasible when you have data available on the status quo tax schedule, on the income distribution, and on the behavioral responses to taxation. Yeah, so that's, um, that's um, sort of the idea. We not just want to have an abstract characterization of politically feasible reforms, but we want to have a sufficient statistics approach that tells you um, whether you have a Pareto efficient tax system or not. And then once you know whether you have a Pareto efficient tax system or not, you know what type of reform um, is politically feasible above and below the median income. Now, this is something that we develop in the paper um, uh, in, in detail and which I have not really the time uh, to talk about at this occasion, but I want to show you a summary table that gives you sort of the, um, the, the pattern that you see here. So we have certain constellations in which um, reforms are politically feasible, Pareto improving and welfare improving. That's these are situations in which you have tax rates which are too high according to a Pareto criterion, which we formalize with an upper Pareto bound on tax rates. The mirror image is a situation where you have tax rates which are too low, like earning subsidies that go too far. If you have such a situation, then reducing these earning subsidies is sort of good according to any criterion that you may want to have. It's welfare improving, it's Pareto improving, it's politically feasible. 
And then there are situations where you might have a conflict between stuff that is politically feasible and stuff that is welfare improving. So for instance, if your welfare function tells you that you would actually raise marginal tax rates below the median, then you have a conflict because political feasibility concerns tell you you can only lower them. Um, whereas if your welfare function tells you it's a good idea to lower marginal tax rates on the poor, then you have the possibility of a politically feasible welfare improvement because that's in line with what is politically feasible. Yeah, and the mirror image is uh, above the median. If you want to raise marginal tax rates on the rich because of your welfare criterion, then this is giving you a politically feasible welfare improvement because above the median you can raise marginal tax rates on the rich. Whereas you have a conflict between what is politically feasible and what is desirable from a welfare perspective if your welfare function tells you to lower marginal tax rates on the rich. Okay, so this was um, um, uh, a discussion of, of our second um, theorem. And now we actually get into um, the empirical analysis. And the first question uh, that we address in the empirical analysis is whether this basic assumption on which our analysis is built, namely that tax reforms are monotonic, whether that's a condition that actually applies uh, empirically. And um, we look at this question from different uh, angles in the paper. And here I focus on, on the bulk of this analysis, which is looking at um, uh, reforms of the federal income tax in the US. Um, so how do we approach this question? So we, we, we observe in our data um, how people are affected um, by the tax system in a year prior to a reform. So for instance, if we think of the reform that has the acronym TRA86, these are the reg and tax cuts. This is a reform that was actually phased in over three years, it began in 85, and then the reform was completed in 88. And then T0, we take T0 to be the tax system in 85, and T1, the new tax system after the reform to be the tax system in 88. Yeah, and so in 85, we observe a person's pre-tax income, and we also observe all characteristics of a person necessary to compute the person's tax burden. And then for our measure of monotonicity, we need you know, a measure of how the tax burden of such a person changes, holding everything fixed, including the person's income. But the tax change becomes effective three years later. So what we do is we have, we compute an inflation adjusted version of the person's income in 85. And um, then we get a measure of uh, the change in the tax uh, in the taxes that the particular person is experiencing as a consequence of the reform. So this is how we construct um, the measures of how taxes, tax burdens change as a function of income. Yeah. And here is the summary table of, uh, showing uh, small pictures of all um, US tax reforms um, in the US. And um, um, I will not really go into detail, but let me say one thing about the typical pattern that you see here. The typical pattern is that um, you see tax cuts most of the time, and you see monotonic tax cuts, which are tend to be larger for richer people. This you can see if you go to the very first picture, you see that when you look at these scatter plots, you see um, that this is sort of downward sloping and always below zero. So this is indicating you're having um, tax cuts and bigger tax cuts for richer people. This is sort of the, um, the most dominant uh, pattern that we see here. Um, but there is also a lot of heterogeneity in that. And this raises then the question whether there is enough monotonicity for our theory to apply. And um, so to answer that question, we first look into um, our measure of how people are affected by a reform. So we not only look at how their tax burden has changed, but we subtract the revenue implications. And if they are then still below the zero line, we count them as reform winners. 
and otherwise they are reform losers and we do this per decile. And um, we also note that um, our assessment of whether a person is a reform winner or a reform loser depends on how pronounced the behavioral responses to taxation are. And we take that into account by, um, so we need to come up with estimates for the post-reform income and our estimates will depend on behavioral responses, i.e. on the elasticity of taxable income. And um, so if we look at a graph like this one, like, uh, if, if we look at, the, at how this looks like, we see a graph like this one. And um, let me zoom in here um, um, a bit so that uh, we can look at things in a bit more detail now. So the, the figure that you see here is, is showing the Reagan tax cuts. And the Reagan tax cuts were of the pattern that I just described, um, larger tax cuts for richer people. And you see that how we assess behavioral responses to taxation matters for our assessment of the political feasibility of that reform. Um, so, the yellow dots correspond to very large behavioral responses. And if we look at the yellow dots, we see that people are beneficiaries of tax cuts, even taking account of the revenue implications of the reform. In particular, people close to median income have dots below the zero line. If there are no behavioral responses, that would correspond to the blue dots, they are above the zero line, that would indicate that they have tax cuts, but that the revenue loss is so substantial that they are losers from the reform. Now you see here in a nutshell that your assessment of the behavioral responses to taxation matter for the question whether a person benefits or loses from a tax reform. So the general pattern is that you know tax cuts are attractive for the median voter if behavioral responses are pronounced and they're not so attractive for the median voter if they're little behavioral responses to taxation. Um, so, but what really matters for us when we talk about uh, the median voter theorem, then we are really saying that um, support of the median voter and support in the majority um, uh, of the population, that these two things really go together and what you see on this graph here is um, an overview of how majority support relates to support by the median voter. So in, for, for any such reform you have on the um, vertical axis, a measure of support in the population at large, and you have um, on the horizontal axis, a measure of support by people with close to median income. And again, I'm not, I'm not going into detail here, but you know, points in the lower left corner means that there's opposition in the population at large and there's opposition by most people with close to median income. Points in the upper right corner indicate that you have majority support in the population and for people close to median income. Yeah, so the basic, um, so the basic message here is that um, you know, points in the lower left and the upper right corner, they correspond to the pattern that's stipulated by the median voter theorem, that majority support and support by the median voter go together. And if we look at uh, all these pictures, we see that typically the points are in the corners where we want to see them. So we conclude from that, that the median voter theorem sort of has stipulates a relation that we can also find in the data. Um, I'm running a bit out of time. So I, 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 I skip sort of the empirical analysis now that's based on theorem two. This is, uh, remember what that was about, the prediction that sequences of, of politically feasible reforms generate a pressure to lower taxes for the poor and to raise taxes on the rich and to have um, pronounced progression in between. So we have sort of also an empirical analysis uh, of the question whether we can find that pattern in the tax reforms um, uh, in the US. Uh, let me just quickly summarize what we find there. So, so we sort of find that there was a tendency towards lower taxes for the poor 
also for increased progression um, for somewhat higher incomes, but we do not really have the um, finding that, you know, there was that taxes uh, for the rich were increased, quite to the contrary. And we have uh, a debate uh, in the paper saying that whether or not this is um, uh, to be understood through the lens of our framework depends on um, the behavioral responses to taxation. If one believes that the elasticity of taxable income is quite high, like as high as one, then um, it's actually in line with our theory because then taxes on the rich oftentimes were inefficiently high. And so there was no room to increase taxes on the rich any further. Whereas with the view that um, elasticity of taxable income is much lower, it's indeed a puzzle uh, through the lens of our framework that um, taxes on the rich haven't been raised more. Okay, so let me um, come to the conclusion. So what this paper is doing, it develops a theory of politically feasible tax reforms. It looks at reforms of the US federal income tax through the lens um, of this theory. It looks at to what extent tax reforms were monotonic. It looks at whether majority support and support by the median voter go together. It characterizes the Pareto bounds um, for efficient tax systems and it looks at uh, the directions for reforms that were taken uh, and, and how they relate to the theory that we develop. We think that this is um, a framework that we introduce here, which has man, many potential uh, implications. And um, uh, let me mention a couple of things which are on our agenda. So we want to look at other countries. Um, to, uh, these are steps towards a political economy's perspective on the history of income taxation. So we want to in particular look at, at Germany and France. We are currently in the process of working on that. And then we also want to apply this framework to more specific questions um, in taxation. For instance, we, we're working on uh, a political economy analysis of the taxation of couples. Uh, we're also thinking about a political economy analysis of capital taxation. Um, and um, for now, I, I want to um, end the presentation and I'm looking forward uh, now to your questions and comments. Okay, so then I will, uh, let me first say thank you, Felix, for the presentation. Um, we have two questions so far and I will start to um, provide these relatively broad questions, uh, rephrasing them in my own words, and then I can take further questions. So um, the first question is by Peter Crampton, who's basically saying that your analysis seems to be based on the assumption that uh, voters are um, acting in their self-interest, so only interested in their own uh, well-being. And he's wondering whether, based on uh, observing the US uh, politics, uh, an alternative would be to assume that there are special interests to play a role and to uh, have an influence on which proposals are chosen to be shown to the, to the voters. Mm -hmm. um, and then maybe the voters are, uh, can be deceived. So uh, is your analysis in any way uh, able to cover these aspects? And can you say something about uh, how the reforms that the voters see are chosen? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, thank you for the question, Peter. Um, I have a couple of responses to that. So one is uh, about behavioral assumptions. So our analysis really has been based on, on the assumption that, you know, whether there is a person who supports a reform or not is governed by the person's self-interest. And this is of course questionable because many people also have other political preferences when they judge um, redistributive taxation and would not only judge that on the basis of their own self-interest. So this is something that we, is one of the extensions that we do in the online appendix. So we have an extension of our analysis where voters also would like to correct income differences uh, or that they attribute to luck or um, patronage or undeserved incomes. And we 
show that sort of the basic logic of the median voter theorem also extends to such a case. But what we're not dealing with here is um, an explicit analysis of special interest politics. Um, but there's one aspect um, that, that we observe in our data and which maybe talks to that. So, you know, the basic idea is that money buys can buy influence. And that's of course also documented in many ways. Um, and the question is how far is it going? Now, if we look at the tax reforms that were particularly attractive for the rich, you know, we have these many examples of tax cuts, which were more sizable for richer taxpayers. The Reagan tax cuts were like that. The, more, the most recent reform of Trump was like that. And we have many others. You see that the, it seems that they have been designed in such a way that they make sure that the median voter is among the beneficiaries of such a reform. And so he's, his benefits are not as large as the benefits for the richer taxpayers, but it looks as if there had been a deliberate effort to, to show that, it, to, to make sure that at least most people benefit from tax cuts. And um, so I, so this can, so I'm, it's a tentative conclusion now, but it shows that sort of the forces of the need to generate a majority supporting a particular political change um, are consistent um, with what we have there. Um, and um, so that, you know, majority support is, is important and not just uh, the possibility to buy influence. Okay, so uh, very good. I would uh, have two more questions. One is uh, again by Peter Kramp Krampen and then one by Thomas Doman. I would now like to start with a question by Thomas Doman and uh, my suggestion would be that I open your mic um, Thomas, so that you can ask the question yourself. Let me check whether this works. Should now be uh, possible, Thomas. Oh, wait. Can you okay. hear me? Thomas, yeah, now should, now should work. Okay, great. Yeah, so I like, I like the presentation a lot. And um, I was wondering what would happen if, um, if people do not only care about absolute income, but also about relative income. So I have an a intuition what would happen, but of course um, the monotonicity assumption might not be sufficient. Mm -hmm. And could you give some intuition on that? So, I mean, maybe the, the polar case would be where people do not care about absolute income, but just about relative income. That's probably the easiest case. You know, so thank you, Thomas. Um, it's an intriguing question and um, you know, the way in which we do the analysis is, you know, we have this the basic analysis is by people who are self-interested and then they look how a tax reform affects the revenue they are getting and it affects how their own tax burden is affected. And so I think what, what you are suggesting is that they should really look at how their position in the income distribution is, a re is affected relative to the positions of others. Exactly. Yeah. Um, maybe compromising between, you know, impact on the relative income position and, and, and sort of pure self-interest. Um, we haven't dealt with this, um, with this extension explicitly, um, but I would assume that the, what we see in the characterization is then that we need sort of if a reform would have a monotonic effect on relative income positions, we would still be able to prove a median voter theorem and go from there. It's an interesting thought experiment. Certainly the sufficient statistics would then for, for Pareto improving uh, tax reforms, for instance, would then look different. But I sort of foresee that a notion of monotonicity would also enable us to prove a median voter theorem here or by it, the monotonicity would have to relate to how relative income positions change due to a tax reform. Yeah, exactly. But the types of um, reforms that you had in the beginning um, would not necessarily satisfy a monotonicity assumption, of course. Mm 
Mm -hmm. But I mean, the you know, if you think of a of a reform where you like reduce everybody's tax payment by the same percentage amount as you no, would that, get, that, if that you, would be fine. Yeah, that would be fine, I guess. Yes. Thank you. Let me do a very thank you, uh, Thomas. Uh, and up on this, uh, so this is basically, in a sense, related to to the previous question by Peter. Um, it says that there might be externalities in, in the people's utility function, and uh, this would um, in this was would enter the analysis um, with the envelope theorem. So, would it be possible to extend the envelope theorem to take into account externalities? external facts here, if we have specific assumptions about how these externalities look like? So in principle, in principle, I think the answer is yes, but one would of course have to look at the details. I mean, what, what is really driving the analysis is that a tax reform has an effect that is the same for everybody. This is the revenue effect. And then it has an effect that depends on your income. This is how the tax burden, the change of the tax burden affects you. And, um, you know, if I have an externalities problem and the externality problem is the same for everybody, say, like it's, if, then I would still have the situation that, you know, the heterogeneity in which people are affected by a reform comes from their income position. And then an extension of our analysis would likely go through. Yeah, so we have explicitly dealt with that in, in a model where people are altruists and also want to correct unfair inequality and not just um, think and, and do not just think about their own position. And you know, if sort of the desire to reduce unfair inequality is felt similarly by different people, then we still have the effect that the heterogeneity is driven by the different treatment of people by the tax system, and then we are sort of um, being along the lines of our basic analysis, we just need to extend it. Okay, thank you. So uh, we have two more questions by uh, Peter Crampton and uh, Paul Shem, and I would like to hand over to Peter in order to ask his uh, second question himself. Uh, unfortunately, as the time has already been running, uh, I have to ask you and you as well, Felix, um, to keep questions and answers a little bit short. So. Peter, I'll try to uh, open your uh, mic. It should work now. Yes, hi. Um, Felix, hi, wonderful Peter. talk. Uh, very enlightening. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so my, it's really a follow-on question. Um, taxes are to provide revenue for government services. Mm -hmm. And it seems that your empirical work is focusing on the uh, the cost to the taxpayer uh, rather than the benefit side of the government services that are received. And I'm just wondering, uh, is it possible to include the, the impact of the reform on long-term changes in government services in the voters' decision-making? Okay, yeah, thank you. It's, it's, it's an important question. Um, it's also a question that we address, um, but not in the empirical work. So what we have done theoretically is to assume that, you know, in, in the basic analysis, we assume that tax revenue is redistributed in a lump sum fashion. So what we have done in, in, in an extension is to assume that tax revenue is spent on public goods. And then we ask the question, to what extent we still have a situation in which we can prove a median voter theorem. So that's sort of the person with the median willingness to pay for public goods. If that person is in favor of um, spending money on public goods, there's majority support in favor of that. And so we have this extension, the median voter theorem extends to that. But what we haven't done is to bring this insight to the empirical analysis and to characterize sort of the, uh, expenditure side of the public budget um, as well. This is uh, something for a follow-up project, but it's a certainly interesting extension of the work. Thank, Thank you. you for the question. Okay, so then 
we have one last question uh, by Paul Schempf. Uh, I think this is an important question, so I would like uh, to hand over to Paul in order to speak himself. Let me see. Paul, you should be able to uh, ask a question now. Okay. So um, my question was whether from what you have shown us, um, you couldn't also conclude that your proposed theoretical concept of political feasibility does not coincide with the real empirical US political feasibility. Um, because th there seems to be a stark discrepancy, right? So I, so I don't know what the discrepancy is. I think the, so the median voter theorem as such says there is an equivalence between support by the median voter and majority support in the population at large. So it doesn't, so if the median voter likes a reform, there should be a majority liking it. If the median voter dislikes a reform, there should be a majority against it. This is something that empirically we find supported um, by our analysis. I think the other question is more substantively, were those reforms in the median voters' interest? And there we indeed having a nuanced discussion that depends then on estimates of the behavioral responses to taxation. So most reforms in the US after World War II were tax cuts. And these tax cuts look good if you believe that the elasticity of taxable income is at the order of one. And indeed that's what people thought influential people thought in the 80s and 90s, for instance, Martin Feldstein, who sort of was writing about the elasticity of taxable income in the 90s, was saying that an ETI of one is a conservative lower bound. There are people uh, who have been writing in the 2000s and later, like Emmanuel Saez and Jonathan Kluber, they come up with much lower estimates. And from their perspective, these reforms were not in the median voters interest. Yeah. But sort of if we take what people thought at the time, then actually they did um, reforms that were good for the median voter because they were bringing excessive taxes on the rich back to the normal. So unfortunately, we cannot add up on this uh, interesting question. I would close uh, the Q&A session now and uh, thank Felix for your inspiring talk and the great uh, answers to these uh, very interesting questions. Yeah, so thanks from my side. Yes, uh, thanks to you, Emmanuel, and thanks for everybody for showing up and for the lively discussion in the end. I enjoyed that a lot. Thank you very much.